ethics in photography and where do you draw the line? I'm gonna talk about it on today's episode of Ask David Bergman. Hey everybody, welcome back. Here I am, of course, answering your photography questions. Don't forget to go to askdavidbergman.com. Go ahead and submit your own photo questions there and hopefully I might answer it right here on a future show. Today I have a question from Jorge P and he asked, where do you draw an ethical line when it comes to post-processing different kinds of pictures? It's funny, I also got a similar question from Rui B who asked about my concert pictures and if I remove mic stands or other distracting elements. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, first back in the film days when I worked at a newspaper. Back in the 90s, I was a staff photographer at the Miami Herald and we were limited as far as what we could do physically in the darkroom, right? We, we printed everything, um, on, we shot film and we made prints in the darkroom and it was really limiting what we could do just from a time standpoint and, and just from a, a realistic standpoint as far as what we would take the time to do. Now, there were some changes we could make. There were different kinds of papers we could print on. That would change the contrast. And then in the darkroom, we could dodge and burn. You make the face lighter. You maybe do a little bit of a vignette that kind of thing by using physical tools under the enlarger and our hands. But that was really what we did for newspaper photography. It was all film based, so we couldn't really alter it that much. Then when we got into digital, I was shooting digital in the mid to late 90s. Uh, the rule was at the paper to, was that we could only do the same things that we were doing in the darkroom. So we all knew where that ethical line was in the darkroom and we just had to use that same um, uh, line for our digital photography. Even though it was easier to do more things to the images, that was really what we could do. Now the reason for that is really because newspaper photographers, it's all about the truth and it's about representing what was really happening at the scene. And once you start making changes, then you're lying to your viewers and it really became, it was a serious issue. So fine art photographers, of course, they could do things like sandwich negatives and you know make all kinds of different changes. So they worked under a different pretense than news photographers did, but this was really a big deal. So it depended at the time who you were working for, like newspapers and news magazines, absolutely no manipulation. The truth is the most important thing. If you were caught manipulating an image, it was a fireable offense. It was, that's how serious it was back then. I actually did a freelance job for the New York Times in the 90s and this was on film and they, my instructions from them were that I couldn't use any extreme wide angle lenses or telephoto lenses. It had to be basically a standard lens like 35 to 85. I really had to stay in that range. And then I shipped them the unprocessed film. So they knew exactly what they were getting and it was they know that it wasn't manipulated in any way before they got it. It was a true representation of what was happening in front of my lens. Now today, the line is a bit blurred. I think that you know the real photojournalists out there are still working under those same ethical uh, um, pretenses where they're not manipulating anything. However, other people, of course, can take their images and manipulate them really easily. Even, you know, in politics, we see this all the time where politicians will actually take news photographs of themselves and make changes to them. So you really need to consider the source. I think that's the most important thing now is to consider where the image came from and who's presenting it to you because you just, there's so, it's so easy to make changes now that you, that's the only way you can have any concept of what you're getting. So for my particular kind of work, my concert work, I don't really do any manipulation before delivering my images to clients. I'll still do basic cropping and toning, things like contrast, color correction, maybe a vignette, but, and that still gives me a little creative control to make my images pop a little bit, but I still, uh, you know, fall back to my old journalism days, my old newspaper days, where we really didn't do that much manipulation. I'm gonna show you real quick here, um, one of my images and I'll show you how I might uh, work on it. So this is a picture of Bon Jovi back in 2010 at the Meadowlands. It's of course John jumping uh, at near the end of the show and this is the raw untouched file. This is how I shot it. I'm working in Capture One which is my raw converter of choice and um, I, you know, I shoot, I used to shoot this jump usually a little wide because sometimes he would move left to right. I didn't know exactly how high he was going to jump. So I generally shot it a little wide. 
Um, and just so I had some room to crop and I didn't want him to jump out of the frame, which my early jumps, he would just jump out of the frame because he was going so high. So this is how I have my capture one set up. These are, these are the main things that I use. I have them all saved in my sort of quick menu here. And I pretty much just go down the line here as far as what I'll do. So first thing I might do is a little rotation. So this image is not quite straight. So let's, I'm gonna go ahead and draw a line on the horizon here and that's gonna straighten that out. And that's really all I need to do. Then I'm gonna go ahead and crop. I use the quick key for the crop. So we don't need all of that other stuff around the side. So I can bring that in quite a bit. Uh, I'm gonna bring it up from the top as well or down from the top because that actually makes him look like he's jumping a little higher. If you have all this space at the top, he's kind of in the middle of the frame, whereas here, he's now at the top of the frame and it just makes him look a little bit higher, a little more dramatic. I'm gonna cut off a little bit of the bottom there just to get rid of the stairs and that's really all I need to do with crop. So now we're gonna go over to exposure. Exposure wise, I don't really think this needs much. It looks like it's about right exposure wise. His face isn't, I don't wanna blow out his face. If I bring it up too much, I'm gonna lose detail. I'm gonna bring up some noise in the background. So I'm not gonna to touch that um, and then uh, that's really all I'm gonna do there. Then white balance, there's a number of different ways I'll do white balance. I could do it manually, I can slide along here. This image originally looks a little too blue, so I could also click on my white. And now where the white is, is always the question. So the mic stand is white, I could click there. That looks pretty natural to me, so I might leave it like that. Maybe I'll warm it up just a tad. Uh, that's getting a little too yellow, so I might bring it back down. Let's try the tint a little bit, maybe a little bit magenta. So maybe like that, just a tad. That, that looks a little bit better. If we go back to our uh, how before, that's the before, that's the after. That's really all I'm gonna do there. I love this high dynamic range slider in Capture One. It just allows me to pull down my highlights or bring up my shadows. Um, his face, I'm a little worried. It might be a little blown out here. Let's zoom in there. It looks pretty good, there's detail there, but if I wanted to bring in a little bit more, I could bring down this slider and it's just, you can see if I bring it up, how much it goes up. It's just gonna bring in a little bit more detail into his face. There's no blown out highlights in here, so I really don't have to worry about that high dynamic range. Now, vignetting, I like a little vignette on my images. Obviously, this image has got a lot of black in the background. It probably doesn't need much, but I might just darken around the edges. It's darkening the bottom a little bit. And when I do that, I sometimes have to go back in and change my exposure because I've darkened the frame overall just a bit too much. So then I'm gonna bring that up there like so. And if I wanna control the vignette a little more, I'll actually go into the layers and, and draw the um, elliptical vignette and do it that way. This case, I don't think I really need to. That's really it. Maybe a little bit of clarity. I like to add a little bit of punch. Uh, I, you gotta be real careful with clarity, not to add too much. See, it's getting a little too hot. So just a tad, just to make it pop a little bit. And really, that's it. If I had to go deeper into the colors, I could do that here. But I don't really like to do that. That image is pretty much done for me. So. Now, the, the instinct might be that microphone placement is not ideal. <laughs> it's not uh, the most, uh, really the place I would want it. It might be an instinct to remove that. I, as the photographer, am not gonna do that. So all I'm gonna do with my images, that's the before and that's the after. Now, when I deliver my images, my clients, generally for things like social media, they're not gonna touch the images, they're gonna post them. Um, the only thing things, the only time things might get changed is if they're doing like an ad or a billboard or something like that. I can actually show you another one of my jump photos here was, um, was used in an ad and it's a very similar picture and obviously they're doing all kinds of graphic work to it and making substantial changes. That's for the ad agency to do and not up to me as the photographer. In my mind, at the end of the day, it really has to do with what the viewer expects. So if it looks like an unposed shot, then it should be real. Uh, if you're doing a portrait, that's an obvious setup and I'm okay with some manipulation in that. I'd rather get it right in camera. So if there's a microphone or a, or a tree coming out of somebody's head, I wanna fix that in camera. I wanna move the person, I'm gonna move myself. I wanna try to avoid that whenever possible. Fashion photography, which I don't generally do, they have a lot more leeway to manipulate images, although public pressure, I think, now is starting to change that. So you're seeing more and more people who are avoiding that kind of rampant manipulation. There's a push towards realism now, but models and actors, they're always gonna want some kind of manipulation done for the most part. The bottom line 
I believe it depends on what type of photography you're doing and who you're shooting it for. Um, a news photographer has a very different ethical line than an art photographer. So what do you guys think? Do you manipulate your images a lot? Do you expect images that you're seeing? That Do you think that they've all been manipulated or do you generally trust the pictures that you're seeing with your own eyes? So leave a, leave a message down in the comments. Let me know what you think. Thanks, Jorge, for that question. Remember, if you have your own photo question, go to AskDavidBergman.com. There's a form there you can submit, and I will pick the best ones to answer right here on a future show. Also, as always, you're here on Adorama TV. There's so much great free content there. I hope you're a subscriber. Go ahead and hit the bell so you get, you get notifications. I will see you back here on Ask David Bergman. We put a new episode out every Monday, 10 a.m. Eastern. Hope I see you next time right here on Ask David Bergman.